So thank you very much. It's a, a tremendous pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm you know, delighted to come to uh, yet another party. Lots of birthdays this year, it seems. So, um, uh, I, so I, I want to um, follow on, actually, from the really nice talk that you, you just heard with a kind of a different view of a sort of a broader class of Polariton systems. And, uh, and just to sort of lay, lay out the talk, I thought what I should do is to start by saying a little bit about uh, um, microscopic model for polariton condensations in quasi-equilibrium theory, uh, just to give you a bit of background. Because what I really want to talk about in this talk is uh, systems which actually have uh, uh, other interactions in them beyond the interactions that we classically think about with polaritons nicely described. And so in particular, uh, there are many systems that one can make condensates of potentially, in effect, some which have been achieved. Uh, which involve uh, quite strong coupling to the electron-phonon interaction. And there's a question about what that does. Um, uh, and in particular, can you condense into systems which actually have a phonon sideband? So if you have a strong coupling there, what, what would that mean? Um, and then I'd like to spend quite a bit of time talking about uh, cavity-coupled Rydberg atoms, uh, which have the interesting effect that in the excited states, uh, the excitons which you've created, or the Rydberg states of the atom, have strong and long-range interactions. Um, and because of long-range interactions, there's going to be competition between the kind of superfluid or polariton state that, that, uh, that, that was ju just talked about in the last talk, and actually some kind of quantum crystal, and what might that look like. Um, you know, uh, so quick reminder, uh, without any worries about um, Copenhagen and, and, uh, and other statistical interpretations. Um, the kind of systems that we conventionally talk about are typically uh, 2D. You have uh, excitons which are uh, you know, typically confined formally to a quantum well or some array of quantum wells. Um, they're pretty much dispersionless on the scale on which the light modes in the cavity move. Uh, uh, you have a confined um, two-dimensional like photon mode um, and by tuning the mirrors correctly, you can bring this photon mode more or less into resonance with those two. Um, and uh, and, and that, that, of course, means that as uh, quantum mechanical objects, these two things, um, uh, if you, there's a dipole moment uh, to connect the, to mix these, then there's some splitting here, which is the Rubby splitting, which can be quite substantial in some systems. And as you've just heard, at least formally, um, ignoring uh, inelastic processes, decays, whatever. Um, and I will say, assuming the rotating wave approximation, which is actually critical because it means that uh, there's actually a conservation law built into the Hamiltonian. Uh, but but so, uh, so, so assuming that, and that's generally a good approximation but not exact, uh, then you have this kind of picture the polariton wave function is a mixture of exciton and photon with that mixture depending on the detuning of the level, so it varies enormously across here. Um, furthermore, the nice thing about the system is you get to look at the, uh, at the occupation of these states because the mirrors are not perfect. Eventually, the photon will, component will tunnel out and you'll be able to observe an emitted photon. And if the mirrors are flat, the transverse momentum is conserved, and therefore the angle of emission can be converted into a momentum in here. Um, and the reason that, no, this goes back a long way, but the reason that this is interesting from the point of view of condensates is that down here you have a branch with a very light effective mass, uh, typically around 10 to the minus 4 of the electron mass. You also have um, a, it's roughly the characteristic coherence scale, scales inversely with that. Uh, so relatively dilute gases down here um, can, in principle, have quite strong uh, onsets of coherence. Um, uh, so you know, what have, what's been seen, uh, run through some experiments. Indeed, this is momentum distribution that you get to see by looking at the light. So this is a paper going back in 2006. Um, if you look for the... Uh, um, if you look now for what happens to the dispersion of uh, that lower polariton branch when you go into a uh, putative condensed phase, you begin to see something which looks quasi-linear as if a buggy lubov spectrum. Uh, you can look at real space images and demonstrate coherence. Uh, 
seeing fringes, and uh, you can also see vortices. In fact, you can see half vortices because there's a polarization degree of freedom here as well, uh, and that's also locked by the transition. Um, uh, because it's 2D, you might expect to see power law correlations, uh, and you can find those. Uh, you can um, find ways of uh, setting up condensates that move, and here's a condensate moving, and there's some kind of object in the way here, and you can see going from superflow around the object to ejecting vortices and then solitons. And then you can do fancier experiments by uh, pumping pairs of condensates and having them coupled um, and looking at the dynamics of how that happens. So there's been quite uh, a lot of work, much more than this actually, which has happened really over the last decade. Um, uh, so uh, for what's useful, I, I want to move a little bit um, onto theory space about how I like to think about these. And I will say right at the start that I don't like to think about polaritons as particles. And I'd like to explain why. Uh, and it, not for the same reasons you heard in the last talk, although I agree with that also. Um, uh, it's actually the fact that there are very strong renormalizations of the exciton and photon com component in this. And I rather like to think about models which actually have both degrees of freedom explicitly. So let's imagine, you know, just as a theorist, that you have a bunch of dots um, coupled in a cavity, and each dot can have an exciton or not. Um, and if you're in a regime where a double occupancy doesn't happen, uh, the natural model to describe this is actually a spin model, where an empty state is spin down uh, and a singly occupied state is spin up. Um, and of course, you flip the spins by absorption emission of a photon. Um, so this is the simplest Hamiltonian you can write down for this. This has a single cavity mode at a frequency omega. In principle, there's a dispersion, there's a set of modes. There should be a K index on here, but it doesn't matter. This is the energies associated with these, uh, uh, the, the, these, these spins. Um, typically, there's very little dispersion in here. Uh, there may be quite a bit of disorder, so it's often useful to think about this in a kind of a site-based index. Um, here is the Rabi coupling between this, um, and this is the, uh, uh, the interconversion term, as I say, written in the rotating wave approximation. And a consequence of writing it in the rotating wave approximation is that the uh, total number of excitations is conserved. Um, if you go outside the rotating wave approximation, and that actually begins to be important in very strong coupling, um, th then you, you need to be a little bit more careful with that. Okay? Um, there's a parameter in here which I call n, but it really is simply associated with the fact that the wavelength of light is very big. And the size of an exciton is of order the bar radius or whatever the trap it's in, and that's very small. And so typically, there are a large number of exciton states which are available within a wavelength of light. So n is a very large number. Um, so as a theorist, when you see this Hamiltonian, when n is large, you know what the ground state is. Uh, it's a coherent state. It's just a large n limit uh, uh, of this. Um, and so here is a you know, generic coherent state, coherent state of photons. This is a coherent state of spins. Uh, you know, if you turn spins into fermion pairs, you get something which looks exactly like BCS. Um, and you can also go through the standard BCS style argument with all of this. And you get a transition temperature, which depends on the coupling constant and, and uh, generically on the density of states. Um, uh, so. Um, so, so this, this is what the mean field theory looks like. Um, uh, you can you know, follow that mean field theory, you know, do that mean field theory to find out doping. And so this is uh, you know, concentration. This is the number of uh, the total number of excitations. We don't know whether the excitations are photon-like or uh, exciton-like. Um, uh, you start off with a lower and upper polariton branch. Uh, as you add particles to the system, we hear at a finite temperature. Here's the chemical potential. The chemical potential rises. Um, at this point, it hits the bottom of the band. Um, and at that point, the spectrum renormalizes. Uh, you, the upper polariton starts to push up. The chemical potential clamps. You get coherent light emission associated with this. So this is a, this is a uh, condensate appearing here. And then there's, of course, a ghost branch that, that comes down. Um, 
Uh, built into the model, by the way, of course, is a parameter which we tend to call detuning, which is the difference between the photon frequency and the exciton frequency. Okay? And so, uh, and, and here I've had them tuned together. Um, it's uh, worth discussing what happens when you uh, tune the photon mode way above the exciton. Then intuitively what happens when you do that is that you're going to have excitons coupled by virtual transitions through the photons. Um, and as that happens, you actually get a model which is kind of more familiar from Bose-Hubbard. Um, you get the appearance of Montlobes. But let me just go through sorry, this rather busy view graph um, about you know, what happens as you detune. So if we start with, so here I'm just plotting the chemical potential which sits in the polariton band, again, as a function of pumping. Um, and if you look down at the bottom, I've broken the wave function up. And because this is, by the way, this is a coherent state, so this is entirely classical. Um, I'm in the sort of coherent state limit here, at least in the theory. And so here what happens is that the exciton co computation is here, and the photon curve is up here. Um, and what you see is that they sort of run in parallel. Um, but after a while, of course, you can't put too many excitons into the system, so it saturates, but the photon numbers are allowed to grow without bounds. Um, as you start detuning, um, uh, what happens, of course, is that the uh, ground state becomes more exciton-like and less photon-like. But interestingly, if the detuning exceeds a critical number, which is actually two, uh, something odd happens. Uh, the exciton number grows and grows and grows because, of course, the photon is far above it and you're filling mostly exciton states. Uh, so it's really an exciton condensate. There's very little photon occupation. But you notice, interestingly, that the exciton condensate grows all of the way. It gets to a half in these units, so this is fully <coughs> occupied. So this is just a filled band. And at that point, of course, you can't have a condensate because there are no excitations. Um, and, uh, and the photon occupation goes to zero, and then you begin to get a photon condensate growing on the other side. So this is just the appearance of a motlo. Because you've got, you've, you've, you know, spin half is like a Bose-Hubbard model with infinite U. Um, and so in terms of a detuning parameter, there's actually a mod insulating phase, which is actually, in the model at least, it's hard to see experimentally. And then there's a super radiant phase, which is sort of outside it. Um, uh, you know, a bit more background. That was mean field. What happens if you go beyond mean field? Going beyond mean field, of course, what does it mean? You actually have to include the finite K modes, the Bogolubov modes, and to incorporate all of those. So if you look at what happens, this is the dispersion in the normal state uh, in the, um, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, at this leading order one loop level, this is what the dispersion curves look like now. So these are the Bogolubov mode. This is the lower, and the upper mode is still here. Uh, and as you go through this line, this, uh, the, the spectrum changes. You can actually do this with disorder. It doesn't matter. I won't worry so much about that. But of course, those fluctuations then are normally populated thermally. Um, and that would be, uh, in the low density region, the dominant method of producing decoherence when you go to a finite temperature. Because when I do mean field, the transition temperature just depends on the Rabi coupling. It doesn't depend on the effective mass at all. And I told you that the reason for believing that we should be using polaritons to make condensates was because their effective mass is very light. So where did that go? And it's quite clear that, uh, that, that the, um, uh, let me just run through all of this. So the, so the mean field transition is a function of density scaled by something like, you know, the characteristic size of an exciton, the ball radius, is going to be some curve that comes up like this. And if you went uh, and did, however, your standard theory for, uh, for you know, coslet salus like theory for a transition here, of course, you get a BEC transition, which would be roughly linear um, as a function, temperature as a function of, uh, uh, of density. Um, so down here in the dilute limit, of course, you're dominated by uh, uh, phase decoherence associated with the uh, acoustic modes. But once that transition temperature exceeds the coupling constant, you're dominated by decoherence associated with thermally populating the upper polariton mode. So where's that crossover? Um, interestingly, in these experiments, well, this line is very steep because the effective mass is very small. 
So the scale is roughly determined by taking the binding energy of the exciton, the ratio of that to the Rydberg coupling. So this is a number which is of order one. Uh, sometimes it's bigger than that. Sometimes it's of order five. But then there's an effective mass ratio. So, so this number typically turns out to be about 10 to the minus four. So only very dilute systems are in this region. Um, and it's actually very hard to do experiments in this region. Most experiments are uh, in that range. Okay. Um, so that's an argument, by the way, for, uh, well, for, for a theory which is, of course, based on long-range interactions, which is then uh, very stable, essentially close to a coherent state. And taking that one step further, that provides a justification for what everybody does in practice, which is to use gross Pitevsky in these systems. Uh, so the, um, and you can add to this, of course, decay processes which allow things to decay into the bath and things to come back in. And what that does in the end is it adds lifetimes to the quasi-particles and gives you a damped driven gross pitevsky equation to describe the dynamics of all of these systems. And that, that is uh, often the most effective way to describe real experiments. So how am I doing? Um, started a little late, so I'm, I'm going to keep going. I'll keep this piece in. Okay. So that was really just intended to be a bit of background. Um, and um, now I want to talk about uh, you know, some, some recent stuff we've done on, on two separate problems. Um, one, some work actually with Jonathan Keeling's group um, uh, uh, on what happens if you've got systems with strong electron-phonon coupling. So why might that be interesting? Well, no, let me just describe the model I want to talk about. I'll call it Dickey Holstein. Um, so it's the same one we saw before. There's a cavity, there's an exciton, there's a Rabi coupling. But in particular, I want to think about systems which may be made with Frenkel excitons on organic molecules. And there are uh, uh, many systems which are like that, which can also be put into cavity couples. Organic molecules typically have, uh, can have very large Rabi couplings. Uh, but they also typically have very strong uh, local phonon modes. So, so there's, and so I've added in here just a local uh, Holstein coupling on the mode. Um, and the parameters that describe that are, of course, the frequency of the phonon and some dimensionless coupling strength. Okay. Uh, so, um, and as you know, if you have uh, an exciton um, coupled to this ignoring the photon, um, the effect of this is that the exciton will develop sidebands associated with adding and subtracting phonons. Uh, so rather than have a single set of, uh, of excitonic modes, I've got excitons with sidebands. And I've got all of those sidebands. And the question is, can you have condensation into a phonon replica? Okay. Um, so uh, the, the way we've treated this is to do essentially a mean field treatment for the photons um, uh, on, you know, uh, arguing that that's a reasonable thing to do because of the very long wavelength and the long, um, and the long range coupling. But we do numerical diagonalizations on the phonon. So you can break this up and you can just <coughs> diagonalize the, 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 the phonon states and work through that. So what happens? Um, uh, so the first thing that's interesting if you look at this, so this is now a phase transit boundary with temperature and, uh, and excitation number. Um, I've gone, of course, to very high excitations. It's not particularly physical to go up here. But just to notice that what the, the one of the effects of doing this is because you, uh, uh, you, you can actually get re-entrant mod lobes. So, it's, so the blue curve was the one I showed you before. Um, uh, if you add uh, electron-phonon coupling in here, um, actually quite strong electron-phonon coupling, I would say S equals 2 is pretty big uh, for a huang ries parameter. Um, then what happens is that you shrink the, this regime um, in response to uh, the, the uh, you know, stabilize, if you like, the, uh, the mod insulating states. Um, but if you look carefully, and in particular if you look down at the bottom of this band, so this is raising the chemical potential, just beginning to fill it, uh, you get some reentrance associated with this. So in particular, if you sit here and raise the temperature, uh, you go from an uh, from an empty state to something which actually uh, wants to go into a condensed state um, and, and, and what's happening here. And that's really related to the problem I told you one should worry about, 
is I've got a whole bunch of uh, phonon replicas. And of course, at a finite temperature, I have phonon replicas which exist below the exciton line because I can steal a phonon, a thermally occupied phonon from the system and use it to dress the exciton. So I can go on the anti-Stokes side at finite temperature, and that's actually what's happening here. Um, so another way to look at that curve is you know, plot the density along this axis. So coming from zero now, not from a half, but it, so there's no excitations along here. This is the chemical potential rising at some finite temperature. Um, and now we've plotted all of the uh, phonon lines with, together with the replicas. Okay. And so this is zero phonon, one phonon, two phonon, three phonon, four phonon lines. Um, and you, know, you, you notice that something odd happens here because, of course, there's in principle an infinite number of replicas going all of the way down here at any finite temperature. Uh, uh, you know, they're bosonic in some sense. Uh, so the chemical potential seems to, however, to go through them. So what happens, and actually the interesting thing is that there's a kind of a conspiracy, is for most of these level crossings, what happens as the, as the, as the, as the chemical potential goes through, um, it turns out that the photon uh, component of the wave function vanishes at this crossing point. So that means that, it, so that, means that the, um, uh, the excitons, of course, can't be multiply occupied. They're really spins. Uh, the photons could be multiply occupied, but if there's no phonon weight when the level crossing happens, there's no transition. Um, and uh, so on the right-hand side, what you're really looking at is what happens to the photon number as you raise the temperature. Um, not surprisingly, when the temperature is small, you can only add photons. You have to go on the Stokes side. But as the temperature grows, then what happens is that there are photons around in the system that can actually be absorbed. So the line effectively shifts down. You have you know, a, you know, a thermally populated state. And that thermally populated state, at least at the mean field level, can, can condense. So that's a proposal. It's not been seen. but. Uh, no one can look for it. There's some, I, th I think there's some, actually some interesting data from Stefan uh, Kena Cohen on this, but I, which shows something similar. But my current interpretation of that is that that's probably dynamics, and I think he would agree with that. It's not thermal equilibrium. Um, so now I, I want to finish by moving to a different problem, um, where you don't have local interactions with phonons, but you actually have interactions between excitons. Of course, you know, the basic model I talk about has on-site interactions with exodons. You, put them, you don't put two of them in the same place. But you can have systems where um, uh, the exodons do actually have long-range interactions. And one way of thinking about that um, is with Rydberg atoms. So uh, when you make an excitation of an atom to a very uh, large uh, n value, the atom itself gets very big. Um, and it interacts with other excited interactions on a, a long-range effect. So that produces what people like to think of as a, as a blockade effect, um, and that's certainly been seen um, in Rydberg systems. Um, and there's work underfoot to build, to put Rydberg atoms and to put them actually into microcavities. Okay. Um, so uh, the, um, you can also make Rydberg atoms in solids. Uh, this is some really lovely work on you know, the classic textbook exciton material, cuprous oxide, which has the famous yellow and green exciton se series. And here you can see it. You go from n equals 2, and then you look up at the end here, and you can see the next piece of this. This goes all the way around to about n equals 25 or so, where you can see these in this really lovely material. Um, and here's the blockade effect that as you increase the laser intensity, if you look at these large N levels, what you're discovering is that the absorption cross-section goes down because the presence of states which are already occupied moves them off resonance. Okay. Right. So, um, so this is not work done in a cavity, but there's, I think, work underfoot try, going to try and put cavities around this so it looks plausible to be able to do this. Okay. Um, okay. So what about a model? Um, so the... Uh, model I'd like to propose again is to take the previous one. So this is uh, same Hamiltonian I've been showing all the way through. The thing that I've done in here is just uh, 
is, is to write this, I'm sorry, not as a spin model, uh, but to take the spins and represent them as two fermions with a constraint. This is mathematically uh, equivalent. And so if you like, A and B are the lower and upper levels, but you can only have one site occupied by, as a result of this constraint. So this is, uh, this is SZ, this is S plus, this is S minus. And then what we're going to do is that we're going to add an interaction in the upper state. So the upper A state, if it's occupied, uh, then there's interaction. There's no interaction, if, of course, if the system is not occupied. Okay. Um, and uh, because I'm not smart enough to solve the general problem, um, I'm going to mostly simplify by talking about a, a lattice model with nearest neighbor interactions and then generalize it to long range. Okay. But the kind of things that you would think about here, if you just look at this, is now it's quite clear that there's a possibility of a of you know, an instability of the superfluid state because the superfluid state, superradiant state, assumes that the excitations are spread out, spread out across all of the system. And there's an alternative state which would take the same number of excitations and put them one at a time per blockade radius and produce some kind of crystal. Okay? Uh, so, uh, so there has to be some kind of transition about this to try and understand this. A few technical points, right? Uh, if you actually take the, uh, a long-range repulsive interaction, 1 over r to the sixth, uh, that has some unpleasant behavior because this, you, you can't get to the final answer from a weak coupling instability. As you know from any kind of theory of fermionic gases, uh, if you have a uh, uh, in, in Fourier space, if u is always positive, uh, then there is no weak, weak coupling instability because the compressibility is positive at any Q. Uh, same problem you have if you just want to get to a Wigner crystal of the electron gas starting from weak coupling. You actually have to start by having a magnetic instability, creating spins, and then going through that. Um, uh, there's an, another one which is kind of interesting here, and you will see, is that, of course, if you look at the... Super, if you look at the uh, superradiant state of these two things, um, it has, of course, uh, amplitude and phase modes. Uh, the phase modes are neutral, and therefore they don't con construct with density. Uh, the amplitude mode is also neutral, and it doesn't mix with density. And, every, and all of the action only happens at finite Q. Okay. Um, so. Uh, so what do we do? Well, you know, here's the machinery. Uh, 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 you know, you construct an action. Uh, it has in it excitons and photons. What we would like to do is we would like to integrate out the excitons, leaving the photons there, but also uh, introduce collective variables, which you can really think of as density waves, so I'll call them phi, psi for photons, phi for the density waves. Uh, at the mean field level, you find the stationarity of the action, then you look at fluctuations about that, and we'll see what we get. Right? Um, so we remind you again of Mean field, you've seen this already. No interactions. What happens? Well, depending on the detuning, there's a phase diagram. Here's temperature between condensed and normal state. Or if you look at it in a way that you may be more familiar, uh, chemical potential rising up here. Um, uh, the, then the condensed state is up here. This is increasing coupling constant. This is the Mott lobe with nothing in it. This is the Mott lobe with, uh, no, with one particle per site in it. Um, and here's the condensed region which sort of enters down in this space. Okay. What happens if I add uh, just a uniform repulsive potential at the mean field level? Um, then uh, what actually happens is that you split the Mott lobes. So, uh, so uh, this is really just a trivial effect because what happens is you have the possibility of using a blue shift produced by interactions to shift the excitons closer into resonance with photons. So then you uh, get a regime out here where even for weak coupling, you can go down to that. Okay. Um, uh, now um, let's look at the fluctuation spectrum. Let's look at the excitation spectrum. Here's in the normal state, again, the upper and lower polariton branches. Uh, these come, as we know, from the interaction between dispersionless excitons and, uh, and, and the photon modes. Uh, in the coherent state, depending on the detuning, uh, you uh, get these two branches. And 
uh, they don't actually cross here. There's just a very small gap uh, at this point. So this, again, is no interactions. What happens with interactions? Okay. Again, at the mean field level, where well, it turns out in the normal state, uh, the excitation spectrum is completely unmodified. And the reason for that is that you can't couple Q equals zero superfluid fluctuations to Q equals zero density fluctuations. Okay. However, if you, go into the, if you go into the condensed state, and now I'll just, this is actually just in the nearest neighbor model on, on the lattice, then what you find is that in the condensed state, then because you can actually have a mixing of, of, uh, of the, uh, of the amp then you get a phase and amplitude modes, and out here at some large Q, which really corresponds to Q equals pi in units of the lattice, uh, you can have an instability. Um, so here are the two mot lobes now. And now what you find is looking in this regime here, there's a condensed phase out here, but there's an instability line. So this is a, associated with a soft mode. Um, and inside this instability line, it looks like you're developing density fluctuations at finite Q. Okay. So this is just saying that the condensate is unstable to density fluctuations. Okay. Um, uh, you know, as you, you can diagnose that instability just by changing the bandwidth, this is probably not too, too relevant. Um, let's now go to the next stage of doing a calculation where I look for a ground state which can have this kind of staggered mean field. So in this one, so then I look for the, so now I've uh, again done mean field, but I've got a mean field which, which is staggered. So as well as having a mot lobe at zero and a mot lobe at once, this is a mot lobe at a half. So this is a half field lattice. Um, and at that level, if you look at that, what you discover is that this uh, state, um, across, its energy crosses relative to the condensed photon-like state along this green line, but this is a first order transition. This is level crossing. But of course, the next thing you have to do is you have to go and look at the normal state, the so-called normal state here. This is a MOT state. And look at the phonon dispersion curves of that and figure out whether there are any uh, instabilities there. Um, and then you, so then the dispersion acquires an extra branch. And that extra branch, of course, in the MOT state, there is a gap. But then there's a new mode which appears in here, which is actually associated with the, eventually with the superfluid order. Uh, and that softens along this green line. Okay. So what have we got? So at this, so at this level, um, we have a mean field analysis for the normal state, a mean field analysis for the condensed state. And they seem to be stable in here. Along the green line, you have a point where uh, the MOT state develops an instability to a photon superfluid order. And on this purple line coming in, you have a point where the photon co ah, coherent state develops an instability towards charge order. Good, thanks, I'm close. Uh, so at this level of approximation, one has in between this some kind of supersolid. Uh, you know, just to check that there are no particular artifacts about looking for the order, you can do a generalized variational Monte Carlo to allow the order to develop on different points, and that more or less confirms this. Uh, the next thing one might do is to start adding long-range interactions. And as you add longer-range interactions, what do you expect to get on a lattice? Well, you expect to get some kind of devil staircase. And indeed, you begin to reproduce that. Uh, so you get a self-similar branch appearing in here. This is yet another piece of a mot lobe which is appearing down here. But this is one half. This is 2 thirds. And in principle, there's a whole bunch of things which are sort of down there. Okay. So um, it seems that at least on a lattice, uh, um, one has a possibility of a uh, phase with both superfluid and charge order. Uh, there are now three acoustic modes in it. There's two sound modes and one Bogolubov. Uh, it has two amplitude modes. It has an upper polariton and a charge density wave amplitude mode. Um, the amplitude modes mix and the sound modes don't. But it's not a gauge theory. There's no Higgs-ish stuff here. Uh, and maybe this is a cold ash atom version of Nibium disolonite, which is one of these things which has a mixture of this. 
But I don't know whether this phase continues to be present without the lattice. And I think there's a sort of big open question about whether that really makes sense. This is very much built in uh, to the lattice model. So the last slide but two, because I have some more things to say. Uh, no, just to thank, no, over the years, all of the people who, uh, who uh, worked on this, uh, you know, many colleagues that we've collaborated with, particularly the work that I just showed you uh, was done um, by, uh, let's see, I've lost them, Jonathan Keeling and uh, Justina Quick, who I seem to have lost off this list, that's embarrassing, uh, uh, and Sahin Oreja um, uh, on the organic materials, and most recently on Rydberg Atoms with a, with a graduate student in Chicago, Alex Edelman. Okay. So I'm, I'm done with this piece of the talk, but I have, but I have a remark or two. Um, uh, because th this is a birthday. So, Ario, I'm afraid you've seen this. So, the, the, so Ario knows the punchline, um, but because but, uh, I used it on him last year. So there's a very famous speech in, well, many famous speeches in Shakespeare, but one is about the seven ages of man. And I think there are really seven ages of physicists, actually. Uh, you know, the, the, there's the, you know, the infant, you know, sort of kind of show and tell, uh, as an undergraduate, you know, the school boy, he was sort of dragging to school, carrying his satchel, and that's really, of course, the graduate school. Um, then there's the lover, uh, presumably assistant professor at that stage. Um, you can imagine somebody as lover, I did this right. Then, of course, there's the soldier, the full professor charging forward, you know, bombastic, all of those. And, of course, what happens after that? What happens after that, of course, is the distinguished professor. Uh, so, as you said, the distinguished professor is the fifth age, and actually, what did Shakespeare have to say about this age? The justice, in fair round belly with good cape on lined, somebody who likes their food, uh, happens to all of us. Um, eyes severe, well, it is in this one, not so much in that one, but certainly a beard of formal cut. Uh, and uh, full of wise saws and modern instances. Uh, so I wish you a very extended fifth age, because sixth and seventh aren't really so great. Uh, <laughs> but there's nothing about how long this should last, and so indeed I wish you a, indeed another 60 years of uh, great contributions to science. So thank you very much. Thank you.